The Jesuits expanded quickly around Europe. One of the primary ways in which they went about reclaiming some of the ground that had been lost to the Protestant reformers was to establish schools of education in various locations. They went for control of the information flows, imagining, quite rightly, that by controlling education, they could control knowledge and therefore control the worldviews and mindsets of coming generations. If you go to the Jesuit Boston College website today, you'll see a part where they admit. When in 1547 Ignatius was asked to open a school in Sicily for young men who were not Jesuits, he seems to have seen the opportunity as a powerful means of forming the mind and the soul. To bring people to God, he sought to form those who, in their turn, would form or influence many others. These schools that catered for children of all ages soon spread across the world as part of a covert campaign to turn people back to Rome. The key to it was that unlike other Catholic institutions, the Jesuit schools actively encouraged Protestant children to enrol. This tactic gave them an opportunity to indoctrinate future generations with the rites, ceremonies and symbols of Rome. They particularly wanted to target the children of rich and influential Protestant families because they knew that what was taught to them would have a trickle-down effect on the rest of society. Like Jezebel herself, the Jezebel spirit goes for the powerful man who will influence others. Jesuits also sent missionaries to far-flung places in the world like China, placing great emphasis on the importance of assimilating themselves into their culture. By educating themselves on the language and religion of these places, they could become teachers of the people and work their way into positions of influence. They were incredibly committed, hard-working and disciplined in these tasks, pouring out their lives for the furtherance of their cause. Wherever they went, they consistently compromised their own message with the local pagan practices of the area to get a foothold, just like they'd done in Rome itself. When they returned to Europe from these far-flung places, they brought back with them the occult and pagan ideas that they'd picked up there. In Britain, the Jesuits made use of fifth column tactics. They started filtering into the country in the 1560s, and almost immediately they were found preaching from pulpits disguised as Church of England ministers. In 1568, a Jesuit priest posing as a Church of England minister accidentally dropped a secret copy of instructions on how to undermine and destroy the Church of England. After a search of his lodgings, further documents were discovered in his boots, including a license from the Jesuits and a bull from the Pope Pius, which authorised him to preach whatever was necessary to inflame animosities and widen divisions. They saw no better way to demolish churches than to infiltrate it in the guise of a minister who could introduce divisive false doctrines and ceremonies from the pulpit. The Jesuits also plotted to kill Queen Elizabeth I on many occasions so that the country could be returned to Rome. The Spanish Armada of 1588 was one such attempt to sail against Britain and overthrow the Queen who was seen as heretical and illegitimate by Rome. The Spanish Armada was defeated, but true to the Jesuit oath, that which could not be achieved in the open was pursued in secret. After Elizabeth I died and James I took to the throne, Jesuits attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament in 1605. The infamous November V gunpowder plot, led by Guy Fox, an event we celebrate in Britain every year. There were also murmurings and suspicions that the Jesuits were responsible for the Great Fire of London in 1666, although there seems to be little hard and fast evidence to support the theory. There was simply a mysterious book written in 1667 by a man claiming to be a Catholic Christian, in which he portrayed the Pope as fanning the flames that ravaged the city. In truth, the Jesuits were largely frustrated in Britain, but they did have more success in Europe. Having established themselves in Italy, Spain, Portugal and Austria, they set their sights on Germany, the birthplace of the Reformation. There they gained influence with the rulers and initiated campaigns of persecution against Christians. In keeping with their oath to stir up division and bloodshed in countries that were previously enjoying peace and prosperity for the sake of the Catholic Church, this persecution of Christians led to much disruption, war and bloodshed around Europe. They reignited the persecution against Protestants in Germany, leading to the Thirty Years' War of 1618. Although Protestant Sweden stepped in to stop Germany from being returned to Catholic darkness, it left the country in ruins for a long time afterwards. In the neighbouring Austro-Hungarian Empire, Jesuits were so influential that they virtually controlled the emperor at the time. 
having this power, they came pretty close to purging the region of true Christianity. In Poland, which was a major European power in the mid-16th century due to their embracing of the Reformation, Jesuits also became enormously influential. This influence led to a decline in national well-being and disastrous policies towards neighbours that eventually led to their annihilation. Entry into France was slower, but was achieved by the formation of educational institutions. Jesuits were implicated in the assassination of the French King Henry III in 1589 and his successor, Henry IV, in 1610. They believed it was their right to kill any heretical monarch. They took the initials INRI, which biblically represented the Roman inscription above Jesus' head on the cross, meaning Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and gave it a double hidden meaning which meant it is just to annihilate impious rulers. If you read their oath, you'll know that they paid no respect to rank or position. The French king Louis XIV was more to the Jesuits' liking, though. Louis had a Jesuit confessor from childhood whose influence turned him into a fanatical bigot, unleashing terrible persecution against Protestants. Louis also led an immoral life, and the Jesuit confessor made careful use of his secrets to have him trembling at his feet for forgiveness. This was a common tactic by Catholic priests generally, to use the confessional booth to gain access to secrets that could be used for blackmail later. Knowledge is power. By 1685, the situation was severe enough for hundreds of thousands of French citizens to flee for their lives to remote areas, and those that stayed behind faced terrible punishment. This was in fact replicated all across Europe, where true Christians had to flee to communities in remote areas to avoid persecution from Rome. Some of these examples are recorded in Fox's Book of Martyrs. As the Jesuits continued to rise to power and influence in Europe, they also accumulated vast amounts of wealth and property. However, their scandalous greed, their loose morals, their ceaseless political meddling and their encroaching upon the clergy had stirred up enmity and hatred everywhere they had been, and this would lead to their downfall. Amongst the higher classes in particular, the Jesuits had been brought into complete disrepute. Governments began to realise that this single group were the source of nearly all the disruption in their lands. In fact, so severe was their cancerous activity that the Jesuits had become a threat to the very fabric of society. Nations could stand it no longer, and the Jesuits were systematically driven out from previously friendly Romanist countries during the period of 1760 to 1770. Although the Pope at that time, Clement XIII, still supported the Jesuits, the nations of Europe ramped up the pressure on him to take drastic action. The French government were particularly fierce in their protests against the Jesuits, saying in 1762, The said institute is inadmissible in any civilised state, as its nature is hostile to all spiritual and temporal authority. It seeks to introduce into the church and states, under the plausible veil of a religious institute, not an order truly desirous to spread evangelical perfection, but rather a political body working untiringly at usurping all authority by all kinds of indirect, secret and devious means. The doctrine of Jesuits is perverse, a destroyer of all religious and honest principles, insulting to Christian morals, pernicious to civil society, hostile to the rights of the nation, the royal power, and even the security of the sovereigns and obedience of their subjects, suitable to stir up the greatest disturbances in the states, conceive and maintain the worst kind of corruption in men's hearts. Notice the very distinctive Jezebel or Asherah characteristics of the organisation described here, the hostility towards all authority, the attempts to usurp it using manipulation and secret means, the desire to claim all authority for themselves. And remember that this shouldn't surprise us as Loyola spent three days dedicating himself and his order to her in the form of the Black Virgin of Montserrat. With her at the spiritual helm, it of course displayed her characteristics. The pressure on the Pope became too much to ignore, and so eventually he reluctantly called a secret conclave in 1769 to bring into effect the suppression of the Jesuits. Mysteriously, he died the evening before the meeting could be held. It was strongly suspected, of course, that the Jesuits had been the perpetrators of the murder. The next Pope, Clement XIV, tried to reform the Jesuits to no avail, and after further pressure from the monarchs of Europe, he finally abolished them in 1773. A year later, he was dead by poisoning, with the Jesuits again at the top of the suspected list. 
At that point, the Jesuits were forced to secularize themselves, and on the surface at least, they disappeared from society, except in Russia where they were allowed to continue as normal. The Russians wanted to use their skills to subdue the recently conquered Polish people. In return for their help, the Russians would give the Jesuits refuge. Since it was the Jesuits who were largely responsible for the weakening and destruction of Poland in the first place, the people of Poland have more reason than most to feel animosity towards the order. With the Jesuit order more or less finished as an effective religious weapon though, Satan needed to change tack in his continued war against Jews and Christians. This change occurred in the Age of the Enlightenment.